the paper that we wrote, um, <laughs> the paper that we wrote there, and um, I mean, we, we've talked about the topic a few times, including once actually in this room, I think, about a year ago. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. on the one hand, we, we don't want to just repeat everything. On the other hand, uh, we had to figure out yeah. how we're going to do it. It gets so better, uh, actually. We, we, when we the first couple times, we didn't even know what we thought completely. And it's evolving as we present it, right. and every time we add more fun stuff. And um, so, so you get the best one yet. So conventionally, <laughs> uh, the, the way we do it is I, I put images up, and I talk about the dead people. And when you see a living person, that's when you're... Oh, that's my cue. That's when okay. you... Yeah. <laughs> well, we, could do it, we could do it the other way around today if you want, but... I don't think we're quite up to there. Yeah, okay. I mean, we're, we're, we dream of the time that I can present the archaeology and he can present the anthropology. I think he's up to it, but, but um, um, you know, I'm math is hard. I, I can't quite sure. do the archaeology yet. Um, <laughs> so, um, well, we did start with archaeology, and we, 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 started with, um, we started with the idea that there was something fundamentally wrong with um, the way that... Um, archaeologists and anthropologists were not really talking to each other about the earliest known human uh, political systems. And then we immediately sort of get into trouble because what do we mean by earliest known? Do we mean the earliest documented mm. or do we mean the earliest that can be known by various proxies, uh, as is often the way with people who write about the, um, the very earliest um, hominin social systems uh, where of course uh, these things can't be reconstructed in any absolutely direct way so one has to rely on comparisons with uh, with other primates um, or with uh, other living human groups um, but actually the problem we started with if I remember correctly was this much more specific thing um, which is what uh, Colin Renfrew calls the sapient paradox uh, which just relates to a particular um, moment, or you know, the prehistorian's moment lasts about fifty thousand years, <laughs> so a prehistoric sort of moment, um, and a particular problem in what archaeologists would call the Upper Paleolithic. So the basic paradox that you start with is that genetically and biologically, uh, it's roughly thought that we've been roughly as we are. Uh, for about 200,000 years or so. Um, but when you actually look at the archaeological record, um, there appears to be this lack of synchrony, if you like, between the ticking of these two clocks, the genetic clock on the one hand and the cultural clock uh, on the other. Because it's only at about 100,000 years ago mm. uh, on the southern tip of Africa um, that you begin to see uh, direct evidence for what you might call normal human behavior. In other words, incredibly weird stuff <laughs> like painting your body uh, and creating designs that appear to have no utilitarian purpose whatsoever but are in some way symbolic. So typically human. And, um, and it's very isolated uh, sort of evidence. And then there's a rather a large gap. Um, and then it's only really at about 50,000 years ago uh, that you begin to see uh, any kind of real um, sort of density um, of evidence for what prehistorians call um, modern behavior, um, which is the same kind of symbolic expression and all kinds of new uh, sophisticated ways of making tools, uh, transforming materials, bone, clay, and, and fibers, and so on, clothing, ornamenting the body, and also, also what has been interpreted uh, by archaeologists as the earliest evidence for um, institutional social inequality. Uh, that's part of that package of, um, of things that appear in the archaeological record um, with um, um, that sort of frequency only at around 50,000 years ago. So the paradox, as, uh, as uh, Renfrew puts it, is that it's why yeah we started looking and and having brains more or less like we did quite some time ago and then for a long time we all sat around sort of looking like the, all the people in this room but not acting like them Precisely. <laughs> yeah and then suddenly they did and, and, and suddenly they did so yeah. why um, yeah. and there are two answers out there in the literature broadly speaking um, one of them is that there is a very late mutation in the human brain, which coincides with this sort of thing at around 50,000 years ago. Um, 
personally, I don't find that very convincing. Since there's no evidence whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. There's, no, there's no evidence for it. <laughs> yeah. um, it also wouldn't explain very well why um, so much of the, the evidence for this kind of behavior yeah. is concentrated in a particular uh, part of the world, um, which is now part of Europe and the Mediterranean. Um, how can you have a localized yeah. mental mutation which then spreads to the whole species? Right. Not to mention it starts in Africa and then it stops for a while, then it starts again somewhere else. So how's right. that a mutation, right? So we don't, <laughs> we don't really buy that. Um, there's another kind of explanation uh, which was developed partially at UCL by my colleague uh, Stephen Shannon, which is about um, population densities. And um, it argues that when uh, populations of hunter-gatherers past a certain uh, threshold uh, of density, uh, the rates of uh, transmitting culture um, became incremental, so that innovations of one sort or another would simply be passed on with greater and greater frequency so that they sort of stick and become permanent uh, features of human societies. Um, that seems to have some advantages. It would explain um, quite well why it is in this sort of area um, that you see evidence uh, for those kind of um, stereotypically modern behaviours, because Europe at the time uh, is obviously, at the time, what, what, what do we mean by the time, let's say at the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago, Europe of course is on the edge uh, of a huge glacier, and then the shaded bits on our map um, these are what uh, geographers call refugia, um, little um, or reasonably small pockets of inhabitable land sandwiched between the forests around the coasts uh, and the glacial regions to the north. Uh, so really this kind of steppe tundra parkland where all kinds of living species, not just humans but all the animals and plants that they use, become concentrated. Um, and um, it's in those kind of uh, those kind of settings, really, that the whole drama is played out. Uh, part of the question is who is who are the actors? Mm. Are they these sort of uh, Rousseau-like uh, little bands mm. of uh, hunter-gatherers uh, with very egalitarian sort of social structures, um, or are they something quite uh, different? Um, and one of the things that struck us, right, was just the sheer ambivalence of people who write on this topic. Yeah. Um, we, we could give you a quote, for example, um, by um, a primatologist and sociobiologist, Christopher Berm, uh, who wrote uh, Hierarchy in the Forest. Um, and, you know, he, he makes a point that personally I would agree with, which is that we don't have to have this endless debate between Hobbes and Rousseau. Were we originally hierarchical? Were we originally uh, egalitarian? Uh, it's a false dichotomy, he says. Uh, what makes us human um, is that we're much more complex than that. We have all these clever strategies for resisting domination. We can ridicule people. We can uh, censure them. We can ostracize them. And we can come up with clever sorts of institutions for limiting the exercise of power. But then he goes on and does this. Do you want to be burned? Oh, I will be burned. Yeah. Then, uh, then he does this. At that time, people were beginning to live increasingly in chiefdoms. He's German. Oh, he's... Oh, you... <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to do German. I could do... No. Um, all right. At, at that time, people were beginning to live increasingly in chiefdoms. That's 5,000 years ago. Yeah. Because he makes a major assumption. Mm. Well, that's not... 5,000 years, you mean... Yeah, no, it's 5,000. Really? That's his assumption. That's a direct quote. Ah. Oh, major, uh, yes. Um, the major assumption that humans were egalitarian for thousands of generations before hierarchical societies began to appear, which he places around 5,000 years ago. Um, at that time, people were beginning to live increasingly in chiefdoms, societies of highly privileged individuals who occupied hereditary positions of power. From certain well-developed chiefdoms came the six early civilizations with their powerful and often despotic leaders. But before 12,000 years ago, humans basically were egalitarian. They lived in what might be called societies of equals, with minimal political centralization and no social classes. Everyone participated in group decisions, and outside the family, there were no dominators. Right, which raises mm -hmm. an obvious question, right? 
What, what is that question, David? <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, if, we, if our species has this ingrained capacity for uh, political complexity, why did we leave it on the shelf for mm. most of our history? Mm. Um, why, uh, why would you uh, postulate that for most of human history, human societies were basically egalitarian, um, when you've just made the argument that... They don't have to be. They yeah. don't have to be. Um, so um, this raises a problem. It also raises a particular problem for archaeologists who've been arguing for quite a while mm -hmm. that there is very clear evidence for something like ranked societies or hierarchical societies right back to the late Pleistocene. So I think one of the things that we started off thinking was, you know, why do we have to choose, mm -hmm. right, between these very stark alternatives? Right, and, and the way they, they, they do it is, like, either you're just totally simple, you have no social structure, basically, you live in tiny bands, um, and uh, simplicity means equality, or you're complex, and if you're complex, well, then somebody's running the show and people are pushing each other around, and these are assumed to be the same. Complexity necessarily means hierarchy. Yeah. Social hierarchy. Yeah. And then we read Robert Lowy. We did. <laughs> and that was important. <laughs> that was important because we discovered that essentially the literature on hunter-gatherers kind of changed in mid-20th century. Um, that in the early part of the 20th century, you know, one of the founding uh, works was Marcel Moses' work on the Eskimo, in a way, but he called it Seasonal Variations of the Eskimo, um, which was all about how social structures go back and forth between highly simple dispersed forms during certain seasons of the year. And then um, in, in the case of, of the Inuit, there's one season where they're mostly hunting caribou, they're land animals, they go off in these little family groups. Uh, and the family groups are actually very hierarchically organized or patriarchal, they have private property, there's, um, a, there's a head honcho in charge of every one. Um, and then in other seasons, they, they gather together on the coasts for seal hunting um, under the ages of Sedna, goddess of the seals, and everything completely changes. They, that's when they have the, the big igloos, but they're communal uh, with multi-families living together. They have giant wife-swapping orgies. They share uh, property. Um, they, you know, the, the, everything is completely different. The way uh, food is distributed is different. Um, <laughs> So you have two different social structures, essentially, which seem to imply completely different ideas of, of what society or life is all about that are operative at different times of year. And that was the old model. Right. Yeah. So we started sort of doing two things simultaneously in terms of research, I think. Mm -hmm. I started educating myself about the Stone Age because I, I normally work on much later periods, but I'm very lucky and I have mm -hmm. lots of nice colleagues next door who could tell me what to read. Mm -hmm. And you started sort of excavating the history like, of what this happened? whole... Yeah. Um, um, what happened? Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's fascinating. There's a progression of... of thought that certain ideas get um, kept and certain ones get lost in the tradition of anthropological thinking about seasonality especially. So you have Moses' work and then Durkheim, you know, um, Moses' uncle, uh, gets interested in this stuff. Most puts him onto the, the literature about Australia and this is how the elementary forms of the uh, religious life eventually happens. Um, but Durkheim takes it up in a certain way. He says, well, you have these people, they're dispersed in little bands, but during that time, they're really just interested in subsistence. It's just practi practical utilitarian stuff. And then when they get together, that's the ritual season. That's where society appears to us, where you have this collective effervescence um, so that essentially the gods are born by, because when you all gather together and have rituals, you know, this thing which is social structure seems to appear from outside you and you don't understand how, so, so you see it as God. So, so um, the season, the season where hunter gatherers gather together, is seen as as this ritual time of social creation where social structure exists. And otherwise, you know, people are mainly just feeding themselves. Um, so, which is, it's curious because it's not really what most tried to sort of make his work do that. But um, 
it isn't really what was going on in the Inuit material in a certain way. You know, in the Inuit material, you actually do have a fairly strong social structure, these patriarchal bands in um, the season where everybody's dispersed. But when they gather together, they kind of subvert all this, and they have these giant orgies and crazy carnivalesque rituals of different kinds, and people put on play different parts. Very similar in um, the Northwest Coast. Um, a lot of those people have different names in different seasons. So in the ritual season, when everybody gathers together, um, you're actually called something different than you are during uh, the summer season. And um, in those cases, actually things almost like states seem to emerge, or state power but only in the ritual, where you, everybody puts on these ceremonies, and there's actually police that are only operative while you're putting on a ritual. Um, it even works for bureaucracy, doesn't it? Yeah. Because we, we, we found this little footnote somewhere in most that the Inuit used to actually mark their property, but only oh, yeah. on a seasonal basis. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you, yeah. Can, you can see where we're going already. So there's uh, two totally <laughs> different social structures in different times of year. And in some of those times of year, people are playing around with things that look a lot like you know, what these guys would call more complex and therefore hierarchical social structures. But it could be either in the, uh, you know, the dispersed season or the concentrated season. Now, so Durkheim takes up the, the ritual gathering together um, aspect of it. Robert Lowy, mm -hmm. who's now largely forgotten, um, a originally German uh, Boazian anthropologist, uh, worked in California, right? Um, he ended up, in, was he at Berkeley? Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Because yeah, um, I met that guy who was taught by him and did the impression of the walrus. That's right. He, apparently, he looked just like a walrus. And um, when he was teaching, <laughs> when, apparently, when he was teaching the Eskimo, he mm. used to because he, he had this Austrian accent. Nobody could understand anything he said. Mm. But uh, apparently, he used to um, uh, teach um, something about Inuit hunting. Oh. And then he would lie prostrate on the desk, mm -hmm. and he had this. He, I've got a picture of him somewhere. Actually. He looks exactly like one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Pretending to be a walrus. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he's the guy. He's the guy. How do you make it big? <laughs> slide, slide from current flight. He's the guy on the bottom left, and he used to lie prostrate on the desk and, and say, "Und as as you can see, I am not a valos." <laughs> yeah. Okay. Louis studied um, Native American size of the plains. Uh, Lakota was it, or um, Oglala maybe? Um, but um, he 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 wrote this amazing essay that nobody reads anymore. What was it called? Um, uh, I discovered this. It's called this. American Aborigines or something. Political. Um, political a, life among yeah. American Aborigines. So it's apparently referred to Americans as Aborigines at that time. That's right. You could still do that. Uh, um, so this is 1920s, <laughs> um, I think. 20s, right? yeah. yeah. And and this article has been completely forgotten, but it's inc actually incredibly influential because essentially he made the entire argument that Pierre Clostra was later to make famous uh, as Society Against the State. Um, but he actually had elements in there that Clostra left out. So what you know? I don't know if anybody's read Pierre Clostra. Pierre Clostra was the sort of anthropological guru of Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, he was kicked out of Levi Strauss's circle for being an anarchist, um, and um, he came up with this notion. Is a sort of anti-evolutionary notion because Fran uh, even back in the '60s, French anthropology was still caught up in a. a still something of an evolutionary paradigm. Um, and he pointed out that even in English language anthropology, there's still a tacit evolutionism. People will say, uh, do assume that complexity and hierarchy are the same thing. So even the structural functionalist anthropologists, these people who are supposedly great relativists, would say things like, you know, this society has not yet reached the level of the great kingdoms. Or There's this assumption that, you know, in order to organize things, you've got to push people around. Um, and what Klostra pointed out is that you know, there's this tacit idea that you're slowly figuring out more complex forms of organization. And yes, violence and you know, oppression comes of that. But you know, that's just part of the deal. Um, whereas um, he, 
he said, if you look at what uh, Amazonian societies are the ones he particularly was working on, you'll get Amazonian societies. It's not as if they don't understand what it means to push people around and give people orders. Um, they've all heard of kingdoms and states. They just really, really dislike the idea. Um, so, you know, the better way to think of it is to think of what he called society against the state, um, that these are societies that not that they haven't not figured out yet how to um, create a, a complex uh, hierarchical society. It's they know exactly what it would be like, and they're organizing their entire lives to ensure that that never happens. Um, this idea actually really comes out of, of, of Lowy, because if you look at Lowy's article and Klosser's original article, Society Against the State, it's pretty much the same thing, except he substitutes South American examples. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lowy points out that you know chiefs in uh, North American societies were you know there's no possible way that hierarchy could emerge or that states uh, certainly can emerge from within the existing political organizations because political organizations are organized in such a way as to make sure that chiefs will never actually get the power to push anybody else around. And he goes through the different functions of the chief. It occurs exactly the same in Clostra, you know, that chiefs are there to mediate with outsiders. They're there to inspire people through their actions. They're there to make beautiful speeches. There's all these um, famous stories about the incredible eloquence of, of Native American chiefs that you know even the American soldiers that were sent in to exterminate them would be like reduced to tears listening to them like making speeches about uh, making their case, and they do it anyway, but they feel really bad about it. Um, <laughs> and you know, and these are guys not even speaking their own language. You know, um, they could still like <laughs> reduce you to tears. And you know, why were they so persuasive? Well, because they had no course of power whatsoever. You know, these guys, their only power was based on being really convincing. Um, so they got very, very good at it. Um, so Lowy elaborated all of this, but then he made one interesting point. Mm. Oh, and the other point that he makes that Kloster also makes is that, so therefore, since there's no possible way that political hierarchy could emerge from within the political system, which is designed essentially to find those people who would be leadership types and put them in this little trap where they're never going to actually be able to be leaders. So that you know, if you're uh, the chief, you have to like work five times as hard as everybody else and give all your stuff away and be poorer than everyone, so forth and so on. Um, he said, well, it's not going to come out of that. It's got to come from profits. This was Lowy's idea originally, or some kind of religious um, revival movement, millenary. The state has to come from some kind of millenarianism. So this was Lowy's idea as well. Um, but Lowy adds something else which is very interesting, and which solves the problem that a lot of people have with Kloster. Because they're saying, well, okay, maybe Amazonians in the period we know of have heard of the Incas, but like, what about before that? I'm, you know, how people are living in these egalitarian societies for thousands of years, uh, often with no idea of what a state would be like. So how are they um, organizing their entire lives around avoiding something that they've never experienced or even heard of? Um, how does that make sense? Well, Louis actually had an answer to this. He said, these societies are, as in the case of this, um, Moses Inuit or um, Northwest Coast societies, um, are organized seasonally so that they actually create hierarchical institutions during certain types of year. So basically, they're playing around with things that look sort of like a state and often operate sort of like a state, but only for a little period of time. So most of the plain societies, they had... Um, about two or three months where society was organized completely differently than it was during the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. People would get together, there'd be, um, it was the ritual season, but it was also Late the hunt summer, season. Right? Late summer, yeah. Um, it's essentially when the big buffalo herds came up, so they were organizing these mass hunts. So um, during those periods, they would actually take sometimes one clan, it would rotate which one every year, or sometimes certain warrior societies. And those people would essentially be given um, absolute course of power. They'd become police, basically. Um, they could enforce decisions, they could coordinate, they would tell people when the hunt has to start and when you can't hunt yet, and they were allowed to punish people and whip people and burn down their teepees and take their stuff if they broke the rules. And they had absolute course of power, um, much like cops. No one could do anything about it. And they worked with the chiefs. Uh, they decided when the ritual started. But then during the rest of the year, they were just like anybody else. So then everybody would disperse when the big Sundance ritual was over. People would go back to living in small bands. They would mediate all their problems through consensus. All decisions would be made communally. So you'd go. So you have three months where you're living in something that kind of resembles a state, but the rest of the year you're doing exactly the opposite. And then something goes hmm. strange around the 1960s in the Man the Hunter Symposium because yeah. this kind of uh, institutional 
plasticity, mm. where groups can shift uh, <coughs> their moral arrangements, their legal arrangements, their political arrangements on a seasonal basis, seems to have been taken quite for granted by most of the people who are describing hunter-gatherers yeah. up until the 1960s when yeah. we get the beginnings of... Um, it already drops out in Klostra. This is the one part of Louis' article that he doesn't include. And part of uh -huh. the reason for that is because Amazonians... Um, it's when they're dispersed that they're really hierarchical. Mm. So it's kind of confusing. You know, they have this trekking system where, right. like, they form these little patriarchal bands and um, they go off and do hunter-gathering, and then they come back into the agricultural season and they're relatively consensus-based again. Right. So it kind of mess. you know, so it's the opposite of what Lowy was saying, and Coster like, didn't seem to know quite what to do of it. So he just never talks about seasonality at all. No. Yeah. Now follows a short excursus <laughs> on physical deformity. Oh, shall we go there already? How much time uh, do we? We could do. <laughs> um, I mean, these things are very important for archaeology because um, archaeologists, by and large, worked with the kind of evolutionary schemes mm. um, that were being provided at the time by ethnographic fieldwork. Um, but, of course, you know, if you accept the idea that a society can morph uh, on a seasonal basis between such radically different kinds of social and political arrangements as mm. David's just been describing, then how can you actually have a scheme like band, tribe, chieftain, state right. when, you know, the same population, exactly the same people, can actually take on defining right. attributes of all these different categories at different times of year, but they're still the same people. Um, and by the same token, uh, we felt this sets up a major problem for uh, the kind of more recent attempts you have to distinguish, let's say, complex hunter-gatherers from simple hunter-gatherers. So if we look at some of the evidence, you know, getting back to the archaeology, um, now the dead people. Um, Your priest? Yeah, I mean, so this is, this is the kind of thing <coughs> that archaeologists um, worry about. So this is one of the adult burials at a, a place called Sungir um, in Russia um, and it is absolutely uh, suffused with body ornamentation. Somebody called Randall White in New York actually calculated how many human hours of labor it would have taken to create all these mammoth beads, right? be mammoth uh, mm. tusk uh, beads and fox canine beads and that mm -hmm. sort of thing and it's some you know, horrific amount of time and labor goes into this sort of thing. And then at the same site, you've got, um, it stopped working now. You've got um, burials of, of uh, young, uh, of juvenile uh, sort of teenagers, I suppose, um, back to back with these extraordinary uh, lances of mammoth tusk. And again, completely suffused with, um, with body ornamentation. Um, there are other examples. These are, these are all roughly from the period around the last glacial maximum between about 30,000, 20,000 years ago. Um, this is the guy they call Il Principe uh, from Liguria, which is now sort of somewhere on the Spanish-Italian um, um, uh, border. And, um, and um, he again has all these fantastic accoutrements, these special sort of... Um, uh, uh, tools and scepters and so on. Um, this is the so-called lady of Saint-Germain-la-Rivière, who's a bit younger. She's only about 15,000 years old. Um, and she um, has all of these amazing uh, uh, ornaments around her body, her torso, <coughs> which... Uh, you see, archaeologists are so much cleverer now than they were in the 1950s, and they can use these methods of uh, isotopic analysis and so on. In this case, to establish that these ornaments are made on the teeth of deer that were hunted hundreds of, of kilometers away in the Spanish Basque country. Um, so we've really got evidence here for um, a sort of superabundance of wealth, including exotic wealth, concentrated on particular ritual uh, occasions. Um, and then there are things like this getting even more recent. Um, this has been a source of enormous anxiety for about mm -hmm. 30 years now. Um, mm -hmm. This is the Haran Plain, ah, yes. which is today uh, unfortunately one of the largest uh, refugee camps in the world because it's on the Syrian-Turkish uh, border. Um, but uh, before the war, 
Uh, there were hopes that this would become a major tourist destination mm -hmm. because of these discoveries here at this place called Gebekli Tepe um, by a German archaeologist called Klaus Schmidt. And what you're looking at are what he would call temples, um, which date to about 9000 BC. In archaeological speak, um, mm -hmm. that's already the Neolithic period, but actually there is no evidence anywhere on the site mm -hmm. to suggest that the people who built these things were farming anything. Uh, all the evidence suggests that these were hunter foragers, um, but as you can see, um, they did exactly the sort of thing that your conventional social evolutionary uh, schema tells you they're not supposed to be doing. Uh, they create uh, monumental stone architecture with these extraordinary How big are these things? carvings. These mm -hmm. things are about three meters tall. They're absolutely enormous. Okay. Um, and uh, they imply um, presumably some kind of highly centralized um, way of organizing labor. They imply a lot of coordination, design, and planning. Um, and they are a bit of a mystery and a bit of a paradox. Because the um, people who built them were, were dispersed in bands during much of the year. Right. But, right. So um, you can see where we're, we're sort of going with all this. But we, you know, we start out by looking at what people have already said about them. And what people have already said about these things is, ah, no, 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 they weren't egalitarian, they were terribly hierarchical, mm. and lived in sort of hierarchical ranked societies. Um, one of the things that struck us about this uh, was, oh, and then there are, you know, monumental architecture and hunter-gatherers. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, it's not just Gebekli Tepe. If you go back another 10,000 years or so, uh, and back into areas like, um, well, actually the whole kind of zone from what today is Krakow in Poland down to Kiev in Ukraine, uh, around the last glacial maximum down to about 15,000 BC, you have these amazing monumental uh, constructions, what the prehistorian Olga Sofa calls the, the Paleolithic's equivalent of public monumental works, which are made on um, mammoth bone, and they're really quite vast and impressive constructions, so it's not just Gebekli Tepe. Um, one sort of sideline mm. uh, which just struck us as quite remarkable um, is that a clearly non-random proportion mm -hmm. of those rich hunter-gatherer burials have very weird anatomies. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and this seems to be sort of a bit sidelined by the people who want to write about them right. as uh, because they powerful, want to ranked sort of individuals. Right, because these are the, supposedly the complex societies which show that hierarchy had already emerged 40,000, 50,000 years ago. Um, and so they say, oh, look at these incredible rich graves. They have like a, a huge amount of labor made in these incredible robes. They must have been like lords and kings. But then if you look at them, just about every one they're either like giants or dwarves or hunchbacks. It's really, it's quite extraordinary. And, you know, you start to think, and, you know, there is a guy who's done a proper sort of statistic. We're not making this up. You know, yeah. He's done a proper statistical analysis. And, you know, it's some crazy percentage of these burials have the kind of deformities that would make you stand out in your social yeah. group very, very obviously. You're very tall, you're very short. You walk like I mean, these are people who would even be tall now, right. you know, let alone that. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and you start to wonder if the few that don't have physical deformities had some kind of other experience. Right, if they were all binos, how would we know? Right, right. Yeah. or just very clever or something. Yeah. Um, something that doesn't show up in the skeletal evidence. <laughs> one eye's blue and one eye's green. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then David pointed out that it was inherently unlikely that the Paleolithic gave rise to a stratified elite that just always really giants, dwarfs, and hunchbacks. <laughs> um, Maybe Tolkien was right. Yeah, so, um, so there must be a better explanation. Uh, we don't know what it is, but um, it just seems inherently unlikely uh, that what this represents is the emergence of the world's first sort of stratified uh, elite. Yeah, something, something else is going more, on. More realistic going on. Um, well, you had a hypothesis about this, um, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah it's yeah. the Flintstones sort of thing. Because yeah. you can see this one, they, they <laughs> dropped a huge rock on top of the, uh, on top of the burial. So the burial is, um, is, uh, is done mm -hmm. and uh, covered with all its wonderful ornamentation and then crushed under this enormous rock. Mm -hmm. uh, and the real expert on this stuff is a guy called Paul uh, Pettit, who I can't remember where he works now, but it's somewhere mm -hmm. in the UK. 
Um, mm. And he's pointed out that actually another thing which a lot of these burials have in common is that the body has been in some way um, contained or bound or trapped or crushed. Um, so, you know, I guess you, you have to, if you want to stick to the evidence a bit more, you have to start thinking of ways in which what appears to be aggrandizement might actually be something rather different. Uh, which Especially is because about, most people um, are not buried at all. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea important. of yeah. burying somebody, <laughs> let alone burying them in clothes, uh, mm -hmm. seems to be what's weird about these people, because the vast majority of people in the Upper Paleolithic don't seem to have been buried anywhere at all. Mm -hmm. the, the normal behavior um, mm. would be that their bodies are curated, mm. broken up, fragmented, recycled in various ways. People make objects out of them. In general, <laughs> people seem to be much more comfortable around human remains in circulation uh, than we would be. Um, so basically, we think these burials even at the time would have been considered exceptional mm. uh, and weird and that they can't simply be taken in, uh, you know, as a straightforward kind of proxy for uh, social structure or something as simple as that. Yeah, they seem to have been treated very well in life. Um, they, they have the nutrition seems to be the same as everybody else. Uh, they lived normal lives. Uh, but then when they died, it was like, whoa, just get this out of the way. You know, put it someplace where they can't get us. Right. So um, we thought yeah. we had to deal with that, right? Because yeah. it's, it is one of, aside from monumental buildings, it is one of the key kind of forms of evidence on which prehistorians have pegged their claim hmm. um, that Paleolithic societies were ranked as opposed to egalitarian. Right. Um, so whatever is going on, it's, it's not that. It's not um, that. And it does open up some interesting questions, as an aside, about the role of sort of anomalous individuals in yes. later formations of hierarchical structures. For example, in researching all this, we discovered that apparently there is no place in the world, not in the Americas, uh, Aztec, Mayas, um, China, India, where royal courts did not have dwarfs. Um, for actually, some, someone's yeah. actually written a book on this. Yeah, someone's researched it. Like, there's always, yeah, if there's a dwarf, they send him to the king. Um, this always seems to happen. There's always royal dwarfs. And, um, and, and there's similar things like that. If you look at um, some of the, you were saying some of the earliest Egyptian royal courts. Yeah. Yeah, they're all physically weird. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> another sort of paper in a way, but it's true. Um, the the, uh, the um, burials of people who were actually, uh, it seems, ritually killed in order to be buried around the earliest Egyptian kings, uh, a number of them have these very striking physical deformities. I've actually seen the bones at this place <laughs> called uh, Umm al-Kab in the south of Egypt, and they're either extraordinarily tall or extraordinarily short or quite odd, but it's a, it's a, that's an argument about the origins of the state. Right. Um, but insofar as there is something, you know, sort of presaging the development of social inequality, right. you can see something going on here because there's a tendency for chiefs to anomalous people, either because they're orphans or weirdos or crazy or runaways from wherever they come from, to sort mm. of accumulate, which includes physically odd people, around uh, chiefs and become eventually become the basis uh, of this sort of extra social power, which later turns into something more like um, yeah. a, a, a chief or state. Uh, but at this point, that's clearly not what's going on yet. No, yeah. and that's something that we're, we're still sort of working on and thinking about. But where mm -hmm. we got to with this is that, well, if it doesn't represent uh, the emergence of some kind of stratified elite, <coughs> what is it? What, what, what is it all about? Um, mm. It does take us back to this problem of the sapient paradox, because whatever it does represent, uh, it definitely represents some kind of mm. marked ramping up, some people would even say a revolution or an explosion um, in um, symbolic and ritual uh, expression, or at least it looks that way in the archaeological record. Other people would say that's just because there's been a huge bias of research towards Europe, mm. uh, and that if we keep looking in South Asia and other parts of Africa, we're going to find exactly the same damn thing, which I think is inherently I, That seems likely. plausible, <laughs> but, but the, the, um, it doesn't really matter where it happened, it matters that it happened all at once, it, and it, why it didn't um, happen for such a long time before. Yeah, yeah or, or why is it, or also, I mean, it is a problem of visibility. Why is it's so visible all of a sudden in the archaeological record of broadly uh, Europe and Western Asia um, at that particular point in the Upper Paleolithic. And it's that problem of visibility of the evidence that we end up sort of focusing on, um, which brings us back to these points about 
seasonality because mm. one of the things that, that we learnt, I think, from the ethnography mm -hmm. is that when Moos and Durkheim talk about seasonal variations, um, they're kind of interested in them from the vantage point of the sociologist. Mm -hmm. They expose something to the sociologist about the society you're observing. But what Loy and Clastre do is a bit more radical yeah. because what they point out is that people are actually highly self-conscious about these changes in their right. social arrangements. This is really important because what happens in the ethnography is, is that point gets lost because it veers off in two directions. So you start from most, and then Durkheim takes it in the direct, keeps the seasonality, but he, he le loses the self consciousness, the idea that people are actually aware that they're moving back and forth between different social possibilities. So he has them sort of in this sort of effervescent haze where they see society coming on them and they don't understand it. Um, whereas in, in um, then you have Lowy, he's all about how people are very conscious of the politics. And Kloster takes that up and says, no, people are consciously avoiding the emergence of certain forms of, of hierarchy of state power, proto-state power, anything that could turn into state power in the future. But he loses his seasonality because right. somehow it doesn't work in a way that best makes his case. So then you say, well, why are they self-conscious? And you can put the two together and it makes perfect sense. You know, you're self-conscious about political possibilities because you're actually moving back and forth between radically different social possibilities yourself every year. Uh, it's right. a regular occurrence. Um, and, and even Levi-Strauss, actually, uh, uh, in his in his ethnographic writings, which nobody reads, um, <laughs> actually pointed that out, that um, you had this idea of the, the Nambiquara chief as being a kind of a modern political actor because you know, he's sitting there constantly thinking, well, you have this agricultural season when we're all together in a village, and then we go trekking, so you're trying to arrange things and mediate disputes and, 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 and work the rituals in such a way that you can get like a lot of people who will want to be sticking with you when you go off and lead people off in these foraging expeditions where everybody disperses and you have a different social structure. But then when you're doing that, you're trying to impress them in such a way that when you go back to the village... You... So everybody's like sort of thinking about how their actions will affect each other mm -hmm. in incredible different contexts and they're self-conscious of, of the fact that they're they're moving back and forth between different social possibilities right. so the idea that these are sort of people lost in the mires of tradition is, is you know they're they're, they're they're playing around with different ways of existing all the time so then the question is what specific bearing does all this have on mm. the upper Paleolithic and on this this sort of precocious mm. evidence for, mm. for social inequality mm. um, there can be little doubt uh, that human beings living in the northern latitudes uh, <laughs> of the Pleistocene world would have experienced much sharper seasonal variations than their contemporaries in other parts of the world. Um, but does the archaeological evidence actually <coughs> support the idea that their social structures alternated in the kind of very plastic, flexible way um, that interests us about these uh, ethnographic accounts. For example, through the regular seasonal aggregation and dispersal, perhaps linked to the hunting of large herds of migratory game. So seasonal periods of not just abundance, but actually superabundance, uh, followed by periods of, of relative scarcity. Um, what I can't do uh, right now is summarize the entire archaeological record of the Upper Paleolithic, um, but I can flick through it. Um, that's not it. No. Um, <laughs> oh, but what about the masks? The what? Oh, oh the, the masks. masks. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll talk about the later. We'll come back to the masks. Um, 15 minutes. That's exactly what we need. Um, because there is France, where you have uh, decades and decades and decades of work by archaeologists, mm -hmm. uh, particularly regional surveys, which demonstrate um, exactly this kind of seasonal flux. Uh, again, it's, it's this guy, Randall White, has done the seminal work way back in the 1970s, where he actually ends up uh, citing Marcel Mauss on the Inuit and saying it was a bit like this because you have these regional aggregation sites including some of those very f uh, famous uh, painted uh, caves in the Perigord and uh, on the Dordogne um, and the kind of pattern that's reconstructed for uh, settlement uh, and mo mobility by him and people like Meg Conkey is precisely that kind of one of seasonal aggregation and dispersal. Um, very similar for uh, Spanish Cantabria 
and famous cave sites uh, like uh, Altamira and Castillo have been interpreted for decades as seasonal aggregation points and there's lots of nice evidence from animal remains, um, fish in particular and uh, mollusks and that sort of thing to back this up. Uh, and there's also work uh, which links that kind of seasonal <coughs> aggregation to this kind of ritual um, effusiveness uh, that you see in the art. Um, there is similar kind of work, and I particularly want to emphasize Olga Soffer's brilliant comprehensive analysis of the Upper Paleolithic uh, of the Central Russian Plain, where she managed to do field work based in Chicago even due the, during the Cold War. I've never understood how she pulled that off, but anyway, she did it. Uh, this is the so-called <coughs> Mammoth Steppe, where you have these really spectacular settlements like Mezin and Mezirich, uh, with their mammoth bone dwellings and their abundance of portable art and she shows that they're very suggestively aligned along the major river systems of the, the Dnieper and the Don um, just like those French uh, sites are very strategically placed at choke points along valleys exactly where if you were hunting a great herd of, uh, of deer in that case or mammoth or bison in this case exactly where you would want to put yourself to intercept them um, and she shows exactly this kind of um, seasonal flux between uh, winter uh, base camps and summer hunting camps <coughs> and so on um, very similar kind of reconstructions for the Pavlov Hills in southern Moravia which are one of the richest uh, areas of the, the Paleolithic uh, record, mm -hmm. sites like Dolny Vestonica, um, and uh, a lot of them have these, I mean this is pretty conclusive really, because look at this, this is a, these are all dead mammoth, well. um, <laughs> so um, you know there's a big debate about whether um, this is the direct result of human hunting, um, or whether people basically waited around till all the mammoths got tired and cold and dropped dead and then descended <laughs> on them. Um, and that's a, that's a big uh, debate in Paleolithic archaeology. It doesn't really matter from the point of view of our argument because even if they all fell over and died by themselves, you've still got a big party uh, and a lot of frozen meat in which to aggregate. Um, so, uh, again, you know, we are talking clearly here about... Um, important differences in social possibilities uh, which are linked to seasonal fluctuations in economic resources and opportunities to congregate. Um, and actually the latest arguments about um, Gebekli Tepe are rather similar because the latest work there, stable isotope analysis of gazelle remains, gazelle being the most frequently hunted uh, animal, herd animal, on the Haran Plain, on the, the, the foothills of the Taurus Mountains, um, do actually link the establishment of the site to this seasonal uh, flood of gazelle uh, down into the plain. Um, so what exactly are we arguing and what exactly are we not arguing? We've got a few minutes to sum it up. I think what we are... Twelve. Twelve, in fact. What we are emphatically not arguing is that these kind of seasonal variations actually cause changes in human capacities, whether that's social or cognitive capacities. We don't believe that seasonal variations had any kind of effect on the hardwiring of the brain or anything like that. That's not what we're claiming. Um, what we are suggesting, drawing uh, the lessons that we draw from that earlier anthropological ethnographic tradition, is that when you have strongly dualistic patterns of social organization, such as almost certainly would have existed on the glacial fringe in the Upper Paleolithic, you also have opportunities, particular kinds of opportunities, for that kind of conscious and reflexive elaboration of social structures, which reveals itself, we think, in the archaeological record mm -hmm. as this apparent explosion of expressive mm. activities. Uh, and in the use of symbolic resources to experiment with all kinds of different social arrangements, hierarchical, egalitarianism, different ways of expressing them materially. Um, so what we're proposing is that the archaeological record of the last ice age in Europe is to the archaeologist a bit like the ethnographic record of the Inuit was to the anthropologist. It's a world of extremities, 
structured extremities where these kind of elementary features of human social life that might otherwise be rather invisible um, become visible to us as investigators. Um, and then similarly with Gobekli Tepe, um, it seems that despite the monumentality of those stone temples, uh, the latest evidence suggests that each of those buildings might actually have had a rather short lifespan, which ended with the complete uh, filling in of the building with the remains of an enormous collective feast. So we may have hierarchies raised to the sky, only then to be swiftly torn down again. So if we bring this all back to the question that we started with, were our early ancestors uh, simple and egalitarian, or were they complex and stratified? Um, well, maybe it's the question uh, that's just wrong. Uh, do we have to choose between Hobbes and Rousseau? Do we have to choose between an egalitarian and a hierarchical beginning to the human story? Um, we don't think so. We think you just have to say goodbye to the state of nature or the childhood of man and acknowledge, as Levi-Strauss pointed yeah. out all the time, that the people we're talking about were not just uh, behaviorally like us, but also intellectually like us, philosophically like us, not necessarily in their ideas, but in their capacities. Mm. Uh, they would have been aware of many later social possibilities. They played around with all of these paradoxes. Um, and, uh, and equally, they fail to understand them just as much as we often fail to understand why it is that our world is plunging into yet another phase of radical inequality, despite mm -hmm. the best efforts of everyone to um, come up with, uh, with alternatives. Um, and um, mm. we think perhaps this is what being intellectually modern um, could actually mean. Uh, so if there's a riddle here, it would actually be why, after thousands of years of constructing and then deconstructing forms of hierarchy, why does our species, Homo sapiens, supposedly the cleverest and wisest mm. of apes, mm. uh, give way and get stuck mm -hmm. in much more permanent and intractable systems of social inequality? And yeah. that is the question we ended up with yeah. um, mm. and that we now want to try and answer. Well, okay, that was such a good conclusion, I won't give one of my own, I'll just wait for <laughs> no, the questions. Do. Oh, all right. Um, yeah, um, it's really interesting to look at this stuff from the perspective of, of anthropology and rituals. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, that pattern of, of systematic back and forth kind of gets turned into a back and forth between moments of ritual. This is what Durkheim was getting at. He talked about a ritual season and then there's a sort of ordinary, secular, non-sacred season. And the ritual season is a time of social creativity where new things can emerge and suddenly people realize they're in society. Um, but one of the paradoxes of this material is that it doesn't go both ways. You have these people dispersing into little bands and they get together into little micro cities and they take it apart and go back and forth. But sometimes the little bands are really hierarchical and the micro cities are really egalitarian. And sometimes it's the other way around. You know, there's no telling. Or sometimes they're both hierarchical and sometimes neither of them are. Um, so so the, the point is that they're different. Um, and it seems like insofar as there's a holdover from this, there's an idea that there's a kind of a, you pivot back and forth between a ritual time, which is a time of creativity where you can create new forms, um, where, and, and, and sort of ordinary life. But, you know, one of the great problems of ritual studies is exactly that. Are rituals basically about recreating hierarchy? So there's a whole school of ritual is just a really elaborate version of etiquette and formality, and it's all about expressing hierarchical deference or imagining a world of perfect order, which is different than the sort of chaotic world around us. Um, but, um, so, so, you know, there's a huge school of ritual studies that makes a very convincing case that that's what ritual is about, that social structure doesn't really exist in ordinary life uh, in any, in the, you know, there's a long tradition in, of British anthropology coming out of these beautiful models of social structure. You know, there are seven clans and they marry in a circle like this and then they have a moiety structure. And, you know, you can do all these maps and diagrams. Then you discover that, like, no village actually has a moiety. Um, you know, no village has all seven clans. They People really marry who they like and they half the time they break the rules. Um, so, 
where are these patterns? It's actually usually has to do with the seating at a ritual. So it's only at specific ritual moments that society and that structure actually occurs. So all those hierarchies um, seem to exist in the ritual moment, and then you disperse and do your thing, and, or you're pragmatic, as, as Durkheim would say. But sometimes it's exactly the opposite. You know, sometimes you have the carnivalesque rituals where you live, you know, as a, an incredibly hierarchical existence most of the year, and then you get together and have a huge party and, like, turn the world upside down and invert all hierarchies, and actual peasant revolts usually begin ver during carnivals or Christmas. These people kind of like that and want to keep it that way. Um, <laughs> and um, so which is it? Is ritual subversive or is it, like, um, or is it anti-subversive? You can't tell. Um, it's very much like the moving back and forth between seasons, which could, like, mean uh, either of them. And in a way, political, what makes us humans um, in that modern sense uh, is not that we're ritual, not that we're pragmatic, but that we move back and forth between the two. That's what creates self-conscious beings you know, aware of different social possibilities. And when we say that, you know, for your world of the childhood of man, you know, we still have this idea that at some point people were just naive and lost in kind of hobby too, so they, they couldn't possibly imagine another way of existence. Nature and society was the same thing. Uh, and gradually we worked our way into this um, self-consciousness of our possibilities. And what we're suggesting is no, actually this goes back as far as you can go. People were, in fact, people People used to be more able to play around with social possibilities uh, in the past than we are now. Somehow we got stuck in a hierarchical rot, you know, like they used to put, set the thing up and rip it down and set it up and rip it down. And one day they didn't rip it down and they forgot they could rip it down and here we are, you know. Built it in stone. So I guess the idea is how we get back to that cycle again. Well, thanks for throwing a big spanner into the works.